Thank you and talofalava everyone um, and welcome to today's climate justice workshop brought to you by Amnesty International. Um, it's an honor to, to spend virtual time with you all and so our topic for today is meaningful solidarity in the climate movement and I think this is a really important topic especially um, considering all the events of this year and how our world is kind of coming to this realization that so many of our issues are intersecting issues and that there is no climate justice if there's no indigenous justice if there's no gender justice if there's no justice for black people and people who've been disenfranchised by many systems that have kind of set us up for failure and so i'm very excited to kind of explore this topic of what solidarity looks like in the climate movement. So thank you all for joining us and please feel free to pop your names um, or where you're from, a little bit about yourself into the chat and utilize that space to ask questions either to myself or to other participants. Um, this will be a very interactive space and so if you have questions, please pop them in the chat um, and then I could get to them when we, we wrap up or when we have time to kind of have that Q&A. And so I thought we would start our evening off with a little bit of reflection um, and a little bit of time to kind of ground ourselves this evening and kind of think of home, because that's one of my, my favorite head spaces to put myself in is, is this um, kind of thought of home. And so I invite you all to get comfortable wherever you are, um, adjust your seating position, uh, relax your muscles, take a deep breath in, um, really try and get comfortable in your space. And so now as you're a little bit more comfortable, I invite you to think of a place you call home. And it might be the place you're currently sitting at, it might be somewhere you're heading to later on tonight, or it might be somewhere far away or somewhere you haven't been in a long time. And so I'll give you a few seconds to think about home. And if you're thinking about multiple homes, I ask that you try and focus on one. And it could be from any time in your life. It could be a childhood place, it could be where your mom and papa used to live, it could be your auntie's house where you felt more at home, or it could even be your school building if that made you feel at home. Um, or it could be the parent, you know, the beautiful home that your parents let you grow up in. Overall, it's just inviting you to imagine and to think back to a place where you felt the most safe and you felt the most warm. And try to think of that place as vividly as possible. So try and imagine the smells, the sound, the views around you, the people around you, and that feeling that place gave you. And so I now invite you to bring your mind back into our workshop and back into where you're seated. And I hope during that short period of time, you had beautiful and very warm reflections of somewhere you called home. And for me, while I was going through that, that reflection, I, I was thinking of the house I grew up in in Samoa, because um, that was my home. That's the home my parents provided for me. And, and that, that was my safe place and the place that I loved to think about the most when I'm trying to ground myself. And the reason why I wanted to start off our evening with all of you trying to imagine your homes is because at the root of my activism is the love I have for my people and the love I have for my home. And climate justice in itself is just people all around the world striving to protect their homes and homes of many more. And so I think, you know, sometimes we can get caught up in the language and the news and the media and almost have like this information overload about what climate what climate change is and what this climate justice movement is. But if you really get down to the root and to the heart of the movement, climate justice and the climate change, you know, activists and people who are in this movement all around the world, at the root of their work, it's really just them trying to protect the place they call home. And so I invite you all to, to try and keep that, that mindset, that thought you guys have of where you feel the safest at, where you feel the most warmth, where that home is, 
um, as we go throughout the night. And I think, um, you know, throughout my journey as a climate activist, uh, it's always been near in my mind what I called home and where I called home. And the reason why this is for me is because climate change is not just stats and policies for a lot of us. Um, climate change is a reality for many of us and for my communities in the Pacific. And when I think about you know, the climate crisis, I think about this, this time um, I was in Samoa and we just got hit by a cyclone called Gita. And it was uh, a very strong cyclone that affected many of our communities. And I remember the night after the strongest winds, um, I went with my family, we, we went driving around just the coastal area that was hit the worst. And it was, it was pretty badly flooded. And most people were just trying to get their homes back together, were trying to take trees off the, the road. And the shop that sells bread opened for the first time since the cyclone hit. And I saw these two little girls from this area called the Vaisingano in Apia. And they were walking almost like waist high in the flood. And they were holding two loaves of bread on their head. And they were laughing and they were smiling at each other as they walked through, you know, the, the, the horrible destruction that Gita left. And, you know, I thought to myself, why are they so happy? Like, why are they laughing? And it dawned on me that they were laughing and they were smiling because they're so used to it, that they must have experienced Cyclone Evan, which wasn't too far behind. Um, and they would have experienced so many floods in that area because of the climate crisis and the reality of the extreme weather events we're experiencing in Samoa. And for me, you know, you can see that as like something hopeful, like, oh, they're still happy but um, you could also see it the other way, which is that the world greatly failed those little girls because you shouldn't have to feel used to destruction. And I think that there's a misconception in the world that if people can still be happy in, you know, a place that they're feeling a lot of pain, that it's okay when it's not okay. And that's why climate change is a human rights issue. That's why it's important that our world do right by those two little girls where they feel happy to go to school, to eat with their friends, to live in a place where they were safe and they were warm and to have a home that doesn't constantly have to be um, surrounded by destruction. And so that's the importance of having these conversations. It's because there's communities in the Pacific and around vulnerable places everywhere in the world that climate change is not just a hashtag. It's not just something we see on the news. It's a reality and therefore their stories are so important in how we, um, how we decide to move forward as a global family because we need to center their reality so that we can best bring them justice. And so I thought I would answer a question that um, I get a lot, which is, what is solidarity and why is it important in the climate justice space? And so solidarity for me is acknowledging that climate change impacts people differently. And so there is many levels to the climate crisis and those who live on the forefront of its effects, those who live in flood prone areas, those who live in communities that don't get a lot of access to help or to aid, um, you know, when these disasters happen, those who can't afford to constantly um, keep mending together their homes every time there's a big, um, you know, monsoon, every time there's a big uh, cyclone or, um, extreme weather event. There are some who are so much more vulnerable than us here, um, while well, myself here in New Zealand. And so acknowledging that climate change is an intersectional issue where those who are disenfranchised in the world get in impacted the most is so important in this, in this um, conversation of solidarity because then we pick out the people that we need to stand beside and let their voices be amplified. 
And so it's important because we need to be shifting narratives to give a better understanding of the climate crisis we're facing and all of its nuances. And so, for example, um, a really uh, a really good example of of what solidarity looks like in the climate movement. I experienced this with the school strikes for climate um, organizers last year, and so. When we were planning for the school strike here in Auckland, and we were talking with um, the organizers about what the march would look like down Queen Street. And there was some discussions about, you know, police being present of, um, you know, different types of people who might not be coming to the march for the march being present. And, you know, one of the, um, the school strikes volunteers said, oh, you know, let's all of us um, kind of create a border uh, around the people marching and so that we can be at the front if the police come and it will be us that they face first. And then one of the other school strikes volunteers acknowledged that Pacifica and Maori young people have a very different relationship with police. And this brings in the intersection of racism in New Zealand and the way that police brutality is more present with brown and black bodies in New Zealand than it is with Pakeha. And so in this young volunteer's mind, he already picked up the intersections of different issues and how having Pacific kids in the front could be a problem and how they could feel nervous about that. And so when we flagged this, we then decided that the Pakeha students would stand in front of the Pacific and Maori students in a way to kind of make them feel comfortable and make them feel like they were safe. And that is what solidarity in this climate movement looks like. It looks like acknowledging that not everyone has the same relationship with the world we live in today. And I think that the school strikes um, volunteers and students here in Auckland really painted that beautiful picture when we kind of had that conversation about what that day of action would look like. And so um, the reason why it's important to, to acknowledge that different people have different experiences in the climate movement is because of a thing called environmental racism. And so this is another question I get a lot. What is environmental racism? It's a form of systemic racism where communities of color are disproportionately burdened with the environmental crisis. And so I gave a story earlier about the young girls I saw in Vaisingano. So um, they are from a community of color and they are disproportionately more burdened with the environmental crisis. Yet when we talk about climate justice and climate action, if you were to go Google that into a search bar, um, you know, the climate justice movement kids, you would see a bunch of Pakeha and Palangi young kids faces. And so this is further perpetuating this idea that um, although it may be communities of color who are at the forefront in the front lines of its impact, it is our voices that always get muted um, because people are just not aware of what it means to stand in solidarity. The second question, or the third question I would like to kind of explore is, what is the difference between climate action and climate justice? Because they're two very different things. And please feel free to um, ask any questions in there if you, if you um, have any questions that come to mind as I'm talking. And so climate action is addressing the um, climate crisis as one issue and one issue alone, that we're facing all this um, climate impact because of one reason, and that's because of um, the greenhouse effect, because of global warming. And therefore, to address and to fix it, we must do things like um, switch to renewables, to uh, keep, the co keep coal in the ground, to keep fossil fuels in the ground to, you know, um, change the way that industries work. And so when we think about just like these easy fixes, 
it doesn't necessarily mean justice. Because if a company were to promise that they would um, act on climate action and not justice, they may just fire all of their co-workers and not give them benefits, not help them trans, you know, um, transfer their credits or transfer their skills to go into renewable. They are not accountable for human, human beings. They're not accountable for all the other issues that they may cause while trying to act on climate. Whereas climate justice is um, facing the climate crisis and acknowledging that we need to center people and communities while we change the way that our world works. And so that means if um, I was a big corporate head who, who committed to climate justice, I wouldn't just go fire all my coworkers. I would make sure that they were given support to move towards renewable. I will make sure that um, every step in the way we're centering people and we're centering community over profit. And so that's why it's, it's important to distinguish the difference. And, and the fact is that many people can live knowing that climate action is what they're fighting for, but many people will die and will be severely impacted if climate justice is not what we're fighting for. And so when we talk about climate justice, it's important that we center communities who are most impacted by its effects. And that we're centering the voices of those who have very different experiences from some of us. And so it's also acknowledging, you know, the different layers of privilege and the different layers of access that we all have to information, to safety, and the different ways that our homes are valued because I think it's important to acknowledge that some people's homes are more important than other people's homes in the eyes of some and in the eyes of powerful some. And so how can people be allies in the climate movement to those who are most affected by the crisis? Because this is it's kind of what tonight's discussion is about. It's, it's how can we be allies? How can we stand in solidarity? And I think one simple way that I hope people can remember from tonight is centering voices. Centering voices of those who are most vulnerable, not just because they can give examples of how they've been impacted by climate change, but because they can um, give examples of how they fought climate change. And so, I have a friend, his name is Iso, he's from Vanuatu, and he's from this island called Futuna. And in getting to know him and getting to really hear the center of his why and the center of how he's been protecting his home, I've learned so much of what this little community um, in his island has been doing. And so um, Iso is, is a, a very special person because he hasn't just let climate change just impact his community. He has actually been at the forefront of fighting and adapting to the climate crisis. And so the island he lives on is a very high island and they've been experiencing a lot of erosion. And they're almost losing so much of their island just because the sea level is rising and eating into the land. And so him and some, um, people in his community have gone and planted these old indigenous trees that no one really plants anymore, but he went and talked to his elders in his community and asked them, oh, what are some trees from your past that you knew to be the strongest in times of disaster? And his, his elders told him, oh, it's this type of tree. So Iso and his friends went and planted all these strong trees around the exterior of, of the village he lives in. And that has been able to help them adapt to the effects of, of climate change. And so he's a perfect example of the resilience that many vulnerable communities have that we sometimes don't even consider because we're so busy, you know, wanting to keep up with the climate conversation that we don't slow down enough to think about the communities that are most impacted by that, and therefore who have the firsthand experience of what it means to be resilient in the eyes of climate change. And so Esau's um, 
example is one of many examples of how Pacific communities and in fact, just island and vulnerable communities around the world have really shown up and been resilient in the face of climate change. And I think that the reason why these stories are important is because many people feel like it will be technology and it will be science alone that will save us. But there's actually so much for us to learn from indigenous teachings and so much resilience within indigenous cultures that can teach the rest of the world how to treat the earth. And so for the planet we live on today, the most protected and the most flourishing environments are actually the environments that are looked after by indigenous people. And so there's obviously this, this strong history of indigenous communities knowing how to look after land. And for myself here in New Zealand, I've been here for a few years, I've really seen um, the way that Modi community love and take care of Aotearoa. And I think it's, it's a very inspiring thing to see. And I feel like there's so many lessons that we can learn from Maori community in New Zealand of how to look after this country because they know how to look after this country. And if we really want to stand in solidarity with indigenous and vulnerable communities, we have to build on this relationship where we're not only learning about their impact, but we're learning about the knowledge they hold and how they can protect their land. And I think that's something that, that's very important and we can only do that if we center their voices. If we acknowledge that there are times when it's important for us to step up and to speak up about climate change. And then there are also times for us to step back and let others who have had a more, um, more firsthand experience with climate change than us. And also acknowledging that because climate change is an intersectional issue where, um, you know, racism plays into, you know, racism comes into play to climate change, like I explained what um, environmental racism was. It's, it's acknowledging that because of those intersections, other people are more impacted than you and therefore we should let them have a say and we should stand beside them and hand them the mic. Um, I think is a very important lesson to learn. And it's something that I had to learn as well because, you know, there's no, there's not only Pakeha or Palangi allies, you can also be a brown ally. Um, for myself, it's important for me to acknowledge my privilege that I get to live in New Zealand. I got to grow up in urban Samoa. I didn't have to grow up and I don't have to live currently in a village of, you know, young girls the same age as me who are constantly having to build seawalls, who are constantly having to pick up the rubble of their houses when there's a big storm. That That's my privilege. And therefore, if I'm ever in a space with a young woman from Samoa, who might look like me, who might speak, and who might be almost exactly like me, but she lived a different life than me because she's been more impacted by climate change than me. It is then on me to let her speak, to step back and pass that mic. And I think that's a practice, all of us um, that are really trying to be in this climate movement should start thinking about and start practicing. And I feel like everyone should be in this climate movement. It's the issue of our generation. It um, seems a little bit on the back burner now because of everything we've experienced this year. But, you know, we, we might have put everything on pause, but climate change did not go on pause. Climate change is still happening as we speak. It's getting worse and the trajectory that we're on will continue on until we decide to put our foot down and to really do something about it. And while we're doing something about it, it's important that we know how to work in this movement and on this issue in solidarity with communities who are most impacted and have firsthand experience with it. 
Now I um, know that was a lot of information, and I'll I'll take a, a I'll slow down a little bit. Um, but if there were any questions, I think this would be a good time to see kind of where people are at. Right, yep. and there are any number of questions. And can I just ask those who have posed questions in the chat, can you put an asterisk if you would like to ask them personally of Brianna? But there was one question that I received uh, from a, a high school student who runs an Amnesty International group for us but couldn't make this call. She, she has asked, um, so I'm just getting it here. She has asked, how, what did it take for a, a girl from Samoa to go to the United Nations? She thought that made you very brave and she wanted to know, how did you do that thing? Thank you. Um, that's such a great question. Um, what it took was really um, knowing well, the, how I got to the United Nations first was that I was in an environmental group. So I started an environmental group um, called 350 Samoa in my home. And so that's kind of where my um, whole journey started. And so we did small school projects like recycling. We set up a carpool registry for our school. We did composting. We did tree planting. And so we did a lot of um, community work around trying to push this message of, you know, um, a start, a, a small start is still a start. And so we wanted to, to impact, or we wanted to make an impact on how we treated the environment. And so we went in and started all these small projects. And from there, I, I got more passionate about speaking to bigger leaders about climate change because I know as much as we can do in the Pacific and in our small communities, if our bigger nations aren't moving with us, we're not going to be able to truly change the world without the help of, of the bigger countries. And so when I got to the UN, it was um, a long journey of, of doing a lot of work and, and corresponding and getting a lot of mentors to help me get there. But uh, I spoke at the UN last year for the climate change conference and a lot of people asked like, oh, were you nervous to go, um, you know, talk to leaders and to, to sit up there, especially as a young woman? And I said, no, I, I wasn't nervous because I knew that I was there for a reason. And the reason was because of my home. And so it, all the nerves kind of went away because I knew that I did the work and I knew that um, my passion was why I was there and that, you know, no one can dispute my stories because they're my stories and they're coming from my heart. And so, yeah, that's, that, that's how I got there and that's how I felt comfortable to be there. And I think that more young people need to be getting into these spaces, you know, and I think that world leaders and actually just leaders of NGOs, of IGOs, of businesses, private sector, need to be um, opening their doors up to young leaders because I know that there's this great need and want to get into these spaces and raise your voices. And I think that there's a lot that we can solve with an intergenerational approach to things. And in line with this um, question, we also got another question before the, the webinar that when you were at the UN sharing your stories, um, your life experience, um, what perceptions have you found from people at the UN about Pacific nations and the struggle that Pacific nations are facing um, with climate uh, change? Mm. Um, for my time at, at these UN conferences, I know that the, the other leaders view the Pacific as kind of the when you think climate change you think pacific and that's because we are at the forefront of the impact but also because our pacific leaders have been very vocal and have been very active in how they address climate change and so from the very first climate um conferences where you know the world kind of established that it's small islands that will feel its impacts the most uh pacific leaders have been at the very front 
of trying to come up with these um, policies, to trying to come up with these treaties and these these documents where people and other leaders can sign on to. And so there's this sense that um, Pacific leaders are, are leading this, this climate change conversation. But at the same time, it's very hard for bigger nations to, to kind of back that ambition because they're so caught up with how much money this current system impacts their economy. You know, because um, coal and fossil fuels is such a big industry. And that's one of the biggest hands that feeds the climate crisis. And so it's very hard for people, for leaders to put profit before people, to put people before profit a lot of these times. And so it kind of slows down their ambitions and it really um, makes them pull back when Pacific leaders are trying to tell them, you know, come on, like, let, let's walk into the future. Let's phase out of fossil fuels. Let's do this. Let's do this. Um, it's harder for bigger nations to commit because they're so caught up with the way that their current systems work for them. And that's why I think it's so important that young people in those, in those bigger countries also put pressure on their leaders because they are the ones who vote in those leaders. And so if you're able to vote in, um, you know, leaders who are more ambitious with the way they want to address this climate crisis, then it will make it easier for my Pacific leaders to work with them. Yeah. So I've, I've got a question from Alva. Just bear with me. I'm just flicking through. Okay. Hello for Brianna. Thank you for sharing your really personal and moving story for being a climate activist. You've given some great examples of what effective solid solidarity can look like. Do you also have examples of spaces, events, or instances where you noticed that there was no solidarity shown with those that are bearing the most horrific consequences of climate change? Yes, um, that's such a great question, Talofa Alva. Um, many instances. And so I, I started uh, I started climate change work when I was 11. So I've, I'm 22 now. So I've been doing this work for 11 years. From the very moment I started, um, I've noticed how Pacific voices and indigenous voices, for example, they just get buried under all the other, you know, voices that get centered. And I think a big example of this, I, I won't speak from the Pacific, but an example of how another indigenous community was impacted was I have a friend, her name is Vanessa. Um, and she was in this photo with Greta and a, a few of the other um, school strikes um, volunteers and students. Um, Vanessa's from Africa. And so she's from an indigenous community that's been um, harshly impacted by climate change. And so they were taking this photo together from youth, with youth from Europe, and new sites decided to crop Vanessa out of all the photos. And so most of the photos that got distributed did not have Vanessa in it, when she was one of the few people in that photo that actually had experience with climate impact. And so that's an example of of the harm that um, not knowing how to stand in solidarity can can happen, and I've been in many spaces where um, you know it was very tokenistic, where you know the Pacific or the Maori voices were kind of seen as a tick box and weren't really considered or taken in um, to mean more than just being there for a photo op. Um, and so there's definitely more instances where I've seen bad um, examples of, of, of allyship and bad examples of solidarity than I have good, but I, I've experienced these good instances more often in this past year. So I know that we're moving there. We just need to, need to get there, there faster. And we need to have these conversations. Um, about what climate justice really looks like and what centering indigenous and brown and black voices look like. Thank you, it was such a good question. And um, we have another one. One is from Maulik. Um, thank you, Maulik, for sharing your question on the chat. Um, so he says, thank you 
for your career, Brianna. What have you found are the most effective ways of advocating for vulnerable communities to be heard in spaces where powerful conversations happen, like at council controlled organization board meetings or ministerial consultations? Thank you, Malik. Yeah, that's such a good question. I think first off, it's having having these communities in the room, um, making space for them at the table and making sure that they're given space to speak during you know, these consultations. I think um, indigenous and vulnerable community consultation is so important, especially when we're thinking about um, moving communities, we can't do that without consulting them first and how they could best, um, you know, implement these projects that um, organizations and ministerial um, groups want to to implement in the community. It has to really center those who it will impact the most. And so, um, indigenous consultation is important. Um, vulnerable community consultation is important and it's really just a matter of someone flagging that and so even if all of us here leave this um, workshop thinking mm -hmm. like okay how can I best be an ally how can I center indigenous voices and you might have a meeting that people want to talk about climate change and you say oh actually I'm not the best person to talk about climate change but I know this girl who's been growing up in a coastal area in New Zealand and she can speak on climate change better um, that's how you show allyship and I feel like we can all practice that and that's something that I try and practice as well um, is making sure that we're making room at the table and that we have to acknowledge that the only way we can move forward if if the best minds and the minds that have the most experience are in the space with us thinking with us thank you Malik. and Anna would like to ask her question so Anna do you want to unmute and ask your question So no, Anna doesn't want to um, ask a question, but she would like me to ask it on her behalf. So um, she has said there's some awesome people involved in climate action Aotearoa, like, like the school strike for climate organisers and, and kudos to them. And it, it's really interesting to say, so you know, Anna will be meeting with the school strike for climate advocates from Christchurch who are attending the Christchurch regional team meeting later tonight. So working in partnership there. But Anna has asked, I'm curious though, do tonight's participants feel there is wide awareness amongst young New Zealanders for which communities in our Pacific backyard are already being impacted by the crisis? Yeah, I think that's a good question. So I would actually ask you all if, if you do think um, that young New Zealanders think or know which communities in the Pacific backyard are already impacted by crisis. If you do think that's true that they do know, I would ask you to put a thumbs up in your in your chat so we can kind of see, you know, what the audience thinks. I don't, okay, I see a couple of thumbs up. Yeah, I do, I do think that, um, uh, a lot more younger New Zealanders are, are beginning to be more aware of the impact of climate change in the Pacific. And, you know, we have um, amazing young Pacific Islanders who have come forward and, and tried to make this truth known. One of them is Aingangalefili Amfepuleai, who was a part of the School Strikes for Climate. She's a poet and she came out on New Zealand media and she practically called out New Zealand for not centering Pacific voices when it comes to climate justice, or young Pacific voices. And so it's good to have young people like this and, and you know, the result of New Zealand media centering her voice impacted us because then a lot of more younger New Zealanders started to think, oh, I, you know, I didn't know that her community in Samoa is experiencing this like this. And so the awareness changes, which is, which is important. Um, so I feel like we're getting to that stage where more people now know the importance of um, 
educating ourselves of the impact of climate change to our Pacific neighbors. And now we just need to take that further step where we're like, okay, yes, we know this to be truth. And now how do we act knowing this knowledge? How can we you know, navigate this New Zealand climate space and stand in solidarity with Pacific Islands and how can we we best do that with the Pacific of the Pacific community in New Zealand and like I said uh, the first step for that would be centering those voices and making space for them at the table and this might be a question you've already answered but but actually I think we need to hear the answer again and it comes from somebody who can't attend this meeting but wanted to pose this question. So, is there anything that you would like to tell Pākehā in the climate movement with regards to climate solidarity and climate justice? Yes, um, I think this is such a good question. I would say to um, Pākehā who are wanting to be in this climate justice movement, to uh, make space to you know um to step aside when it's time to step aside and and you know be confident to pass the mic on to those who can speak um firsthand on what climate change and climate realities need, means to them and i think it's important that we educate ourselves on what these communities are facing and how we can be better allies really is listening to them first, to really um, stop where we are and where we're at, um, ask them, you know, how, how are your family's doing back in the islands? How does climate change impact you? And then go that step further to ask more follow-up questions. How are your families adapting to climate change? How are they showing resilience? What do you think about the New Zealand climate um, space? You know, I think it's, it's important that we be the Pacific neighbors and we be the the neighbors that we claim to be, right? You know, um, we hear on the news a lot with Pacific, I mean, with um, New Zealand politicians that New Zealand is the big sister of the Pacific Islands that, you know, we are supposed to be a great neighbor to Pacific Islands. And that trickles down to us individually as well. We need to be good neighbors. Pakeha need to be good neighbors. And so, you know, when we think about being good neighbors to each other, it's about sharing, it's about supporting, it's about backing and, and helping those feel comfortable in our neighborhood, feel comfortable in our spaces so that they can speak openly. And so, yeah, I think when you think about being a good ally, it's really about being a good friend. How would you want to be a good friend? And how do you think you can tend to that friendship in a way that your friend who may be having a bad time can really um, speak for herself, for himself, and feel confident that people are listening and that you, even though no one may be listening, that you as a friend will be listening. Right, and this is a comment from Malik, and I'd love you to comment on it, actually. Um, I definitely reckon there's very little awareness around which Pacifica communities have been impacted by climate change. There also isn't much academic research, not that research is cutting edge when it comes to social or community impacts mm -hmm. of sea level rise on the subject. Could, would you care to comment on that, about the research or lack of? Yeah, um, so, we know in the Pacific, we know that the islands that are most impacted are our atoll islands, especially when it comes to sea level rise. And so we have um, small islands, mostly based in Micronesia, um, that are only a couple meters off um, sea level. And so they don't have mountains, um, they don't have large hills that they can migrate or that they can move up to, and they're very small. And so these are our islands that are the most impacted by climate change. And, you know, um, places like Kiribati, Tuvalu, Marshall Islands, if you go through, so there's a IPCC report. And so this is um, the report that the UN puts together and their climate scientists or climate scientists around the world have teamed up to make this panel 
on climate change and they've come up with predictions of what the climate crisis will mean for the world. And so from the IPCC report that came out a couple of years ago that was put together by these climate scientists, they, um, they expect the island of Tuvalu and Kiribati and small atoll islands to be the first islands or the first countries in the world to sink if climate change is not stopped. And so it's really those small ones in the Pacific that are most impactful. And, and I'm so happy you brought up um, this converse, this topic because um, a lot of the times you may feel like a lot of um, vulnerable communities or Pacific communities feel like um, they don't have to be allies, that they can only expect allyship, but they don't have to be allies. Where bigger, bigger islands, like for example, me, a Samoan woman, I have to be an ally for a Tuvaluan woman because she will be impacted way more by climate change than me. Um, and so it's important to acknowledge those layers. And in saying that, while we're kind of building this movement um, in New Zealand, a lot of us Pacific, you know, people in this space have to be aware of our privileges, especially those coming from volcanic islands like Samoa, like Tonga, like Vanuatu, even like Fiji, that there are some of us that aren't as impacted by climate change than people in Kiribati and Tuvalu because they are really the islands that are bearing the brunt of it and that lie in the eye of the storm. Yeah, so thank you, Malik, for bringing that up. Can I just ask, this is for me, I, I, just, it seems to me that there's such an interconnectedness amongst indigenous people globally, and there's a real need for them to be speaking out. But are you part of that inter interconnectedness? You've talked a bit about Vanessa, but is there a community out there? And if so, how can we better support it? Yeah, um, I am, from my time at, you know, these various um, climate negotiations, meetings, I've met a lot of, young indigenous people and um, we share very much the same um, ideals and values around the protection of home. And I know a lot of non-indigenous people that also share those same you know, values of, of the importance of protecting home. And that's why I started off this whole Telenoa with kind of grounding ourselves in, in that home. Um, I, so I, I am connected with a lot of indigenous communities, you know, like Vanessa. I also have a friend um, who lives in the Amazon. Her name is Helena. Um, I have, you know, met a lot of people through the school strikes movement, through the UN youth movement, who do feel more connected as indigenous people because we, we share very similar cultures and traditions. And so it's always great to kind of have that, um, that cross the world, solidarity between indigenous communities, um, which have, have been like a big part of, of my growth as well, is learning from other communities. Um, sorry, did I answer that question, Maggie? Look, you did actually, yeah. You did, thank you. And we've got a great question from Seb, who says, Malo lava, Brianna, Olo u, Igoa or Seb. I'm at the Victoria University. Mm -hmm. A lot of my family in Samoa tell me that Papa Ine are often the ones who do a lot of the rescue and rebuilding work in Samoa, but are usually treated the worst. Standing with the communities who are most impacted by climate change, as this is, is an intersectional issue, is it's very complex. Could you explain mm -hmm. more about this? And and before you do, can I just add Seb, I hope you got the chance to listen in to Charm and Tain uh, on Monday, who spoke about rainbow rights and climate justice. If not, there is a recording on our website, and really important to listen to that, but also to hear that Kororo. And now I'm going to hand over to Brianna, who can best answer your question. Um, yes, thank you, Seb. That is... That's such an important perspective to bring in, and I'm happy that you mentioned it. Um, yes, because climate change is an intersectional issue, and how that can also be worded is that 
climate change has been the catalyst that has further made already existing social issues worse. And so, for example, in places that get struck by disaster, um, they found that within their communities, after a disaster has hit, and because of climate change, they're experiencing a higher frequency of these disasters, that in those communities, um, they experience a higher level of domestic violence. And this is because there would be already, already an existing social issue of um, violence against women within these communities. And then you add this layer of um, trauma, of financial stress, of this new burden of having to put your home back together. And it just further makes these already existing issues worse. And so that would also be another example what Seb mentioned about um, Fafafine in Samoa. So he said that his family have said that Fafafine are often the ones who do a lot of the rescue and rebuilding, but are usually treated the worst. And so that's another example of how climate change has further um, made these social issues that already exist harsher and um, harder to deal with. And I know that this is also true um, for example, in Tonga um, and other many places, vulnerable communities around the world, where some Fafafine and some Leitis aren't allowed into the rescue um, community, the rescue homes. And so there will be, you know, a setup for during a cyclone or during a big storm where people can go and find refuge. And some of our LGBTQI plus community don't get let into those homes. And so even they experience climate change in a different way than others. And so, you know, this is why it's important to acknowledge this intersectionality, because that is also acknowledging that a Leiti or Fafafine would experience a totally different crisis when they are faced with the impact of climate change because not only would they have to go through you know the horror of a natural disaster but then they would have to go through another reality of their struggles in this world and they would have to face those two issues at the same time and and that's the example that you know um, you've mentioned about Fafafine. And I think, you know, when we're talking about climate justice, again, there is no climate justice without justice for our LGBTQI plus community. Thanks, Brianna. Um, I've got one last question, but, but just so all participants know, Brianna has kindly agreed to stay on long. If you have questions, she will answer them, which is very generous of her. But the, the question that I've received was, um, what gives you hope? Thank you. That is such a, a good one. Um, my home gives me hope. When I, I think of Samoa, um, it, it gives me this hopeful image of the future and the island that my descendants get to inherit. Um, you know, when I think about the warmth of my home, the, the safety that I feel around my people, the, the love that I get to experience when I'm in my home, I, I get this sense of hope because all I would want is for my kids and my grandkids to have that experience. Um, there's a Psalm 1 saying, which means wherever the Taloa bird flies, it will always return back home. And so that's really my hope in this, this life is that wherever I may be able to fly in the world, I will always return back home. And I hope that everyone in the world, you know, um, everyone on this call, that wherever you may go in the world, wherever you may venture to explore, that you will always be able to return back home. And I think that is everyone's right as a human being is to be safe and to have a home to return to. And that is a hope I have for everyone. And I feel like it's important to acknowledge that that hope is very much tied to action. That when you think and you try to imagine and hope for a better world, it doesn't just stop 
at that moment where you imagine it. It has to go beyond that moment. It has to move to your feet so you can walk onto the streets and strike for climate. It has to move into your hands so you can start petitions to give to your you know, government officials to treat the world better. It has to move to your mouth so that you can speak up for indigenous communities when the time comes and, and it moves to your mind so that you, know, you can contribute and be a part of this um, climate movement the best way you can. And so, you know, I'm very hopeful about the future that, that we can build. And I know that, you know, if we can all carry that hope that can then turn into action, we will live in a much better world where we can achieve things like climate justice that a lot of people think is like science fiction. But, you know, can you imagine if Martin Luther King never had that dream? what the world would be like, it really all starts with that. It's, it starts with that courage where you know that your people and our people in this world is built for something better. Thanks, Brianna. And I'm going to hit you with a really tough question next from uh, Leia Bear. If climate change took your home, mm -hmm. will you still have hope? If climate change took my home, um, that's a hard one. I don't, I don't think I would. I, I think, I think my, I could be honest and vulnerable and say that my hope is tied to my home. And so I don't know where I would be without that. Um, and a, a friend of mine, her name is Kathy and she's a poet. And she has this line in one of her poems that says, you know, scientists predict that, you know, they would, re in the future, we would have nothing but a passport to call a home. And so that is this dystopian reality that I, I don't even want to imagine because it's something that I could never fathom to be okay. And I think that, I always say this, the human race has done many bad things. We found ourselves going down wrong avenues, um, creating horrible things, you know, like war. And, and even at the end of a war, there's still hope to come out of the rubble. There's still a way to rebuild, you know, what we have lost. But if we were to lose our islands, if we were to lose an entire country, I think that might just be the worst thing that humanity could ever do because there's no coming back from that. And so I, I can't say confidently where and how I would feel if I ever got to a place where I didn't have my home. But I don't know, I just feel like I, I, I will never get there. And it might just be because I might be lucky enough in my time to be, to always have some more around. But I, I truly believe in the power of people and I truly believe that there is enough good people in this world to really turn this thing around and to really make sure that I have my home around and that everyone else have, has their home around for generations to come. That's a great answer, darling. I've got one more question. And unless anybody else adds to the chat, this is it. But Anna from Christchurch has asked, following from Seb's really important query, Amnesty International takes action on behalf of many environmental and or indigenous rights activists globally, as they are always at super high risk. Does it seem that climate justice activists in Pacifica nations are reasonably safe so far, or are we seeing incidents of intimidation and attempted silencing by government or corporate agencies? Um, that's a great question. I I think that so far in the Pacific, um, from my experience, and I can only I can only speak from what I've seen, that my climate activist friends in the islands have been um, safe to speak out about climate change because their governments very much um, sit on the same page with the importance of climate action, and so um, you know some of us in the Pacific are lucky to have the same, um, I guess, we have the same idea of climate action as our leaders. And so, for
for example, um, my prime minister from Samoa is Twila Ipa. He has been very vocal about climate change. He has always been a leader in calling out bigger nations about their pollution, about calling out um, bigger nations about not doing enough on climate justice. And so, you know, I've been, I, f I feel very safe to speak out about, you know, what I'm passionate about in Samoa. And I know that I have other friends who have the same um, experience. But for other, um, other indigenous communities, it, it's, a, it's a bit trickier. So for example, I have friends who live in the Amazon and it's, it's a little bit hard for them to speak out, especially if you have a colonial government, um, because that adds another layer of difficulty of having your voice heard. And I don't know if it's always easy for Modi in New Zealand to speak out about climate change and climate justice. Um, you know, New Zealand hasn't made it the easiest for Modi to protect and keep their land. And so they have difficulties having, you know, their voices heard. And, and also, you know, the same goes for Australia. Um, currently, the Australian government and a private company called Adani are trying to build a coal mine on Aboriginal land to which Aboriginal people have not said okay to. And they're still trying to, to build this coal mine that Aboriginal people have been fighting for almost 10 years now. And so their experience is, is very different as well. And I, I count Torres Strait Islanders in Australia as Pacific Islanders because they're from an island in the Pacific, but they're owned by the Australian government under colonization. And so they would not have the same, you know, safety in speaking out about climate change because they are speaking out on a colonial government. Whereas if I speak out about climate change, I, I have the very, I have similar, um, you know, thoughts on the climate crisis as my prime minister. So I would feel safer than this person would in Torres Strait Island, uh, as a Torres Strait Islander, for example. So yeah, that's a really, really interesting question about silencing done by governments and corporate agencies. I feel like there is a lot of silencing being done um, in corporate agencies more so than governments in the Pacific. And, um, yeah, it can make, you know, this activism space a little bit trickier. And Brianna, I'm just trying to clarify a question from Leah Bayer, but while I do that, um, I just wanted to make the comments to all those participants that uh, what Amnesty International knows is that environmental defenders and rainbow rights defenders are amongst the most endangered species on this planet. They regularly experience ill treatment, torture, um, persecution, and including death because they have been brave enough to be human rights defenders on an environmental and LGBTIQ uh, space. So it's, it's really pleasing to hear that possibly our Pacifica people are a bit more uh, Pacifica leaders, but more enlightened. Um, but what I will do actually is ask Lea Bayer's question anyway, and they have asked, have our leaders taken action to help stop climate change? And I went back and queried, is this here in New Zealand or Pacifica leaders, please? I don't know, but are you happy to answer that question anyway, Brianna? Yes, I think have maybe i'll speak on all world leaders i feel like um pacific leaders most of them have been trying to do the most they can to impact um to fight climate change but the, the issue still is that we contribute to, to so little of the world carbon emissions that even if we went you know um completely carbon neutral even if we went you know, off the grid, that climate change will still happen because we make up such a small percentage of um, that, you know, overall global emission. But, you know, it's, it's, it's hopeful to see like countries like Tokelau. So Tokelau is a small Polynesian island. Um, you can only get there by boat if you fly to Samoa. So from New Zealand, it's a four hour 
a flight to Samoa. Then when you get to Samoa, it's it's a one and a half to two day boat ride to Tokelau. So a very small um, island paradise in Polynesia, and they run off 100% renewable energy. And so they're almost like this sustainable island that the world should be following. And you know they've worked on banning you know single use plastics. They um, you know, mostly eat from the, the ocean and, and their land and they live very much sustainably and, um, you know, in harmony with the environment. And so they're a big leader in sustainability for the world. And so I really look to them for inspiration. And I feel like if I say, you know, our world leaders have not done enough, that's kind of not acknowledging the world leader that is Tokelau and the amazing work that they've done. Uh, but if I'm addressing bigger world leaders of bigger nations, I could confidently say, yes, they've definitely not done enough. I think that, you know, we need to rev up ambition. We need to upscale our targets of how we want to um, move away from a fossil fuel run world and into a renewable world. And, you know, because of, of what happened this year with COVID and what's continuing to happen, we need to start imagining a just recovery. So we should not be going back to normal. We should almost be creating a new, more sustainable normal if we want to, um, you know, really look after our planet. And so I don't think big world leaders have done enough, but I think that while we're trying to recover and while we're trying to reimagine a world, they are given an opportunity to finally do enough. Great. And I did get clarity there that it was Samoa, but unless you wanted to add any comment there or you feel you've answered that question, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I feel like I've answered that Samoa, similar to Tokelau, I feel. Um, we are very proactive in trying to um, combat climate change. And I feel like it's because we are more impacted by it and we don't get any money. We don't earn anything <laughs> from the industries that cause the climate crisis. And so, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and that's a, a, a great place to end because it's kind of almost where we started, where, where I said the legitimate voices in this struggle were youth and Pacifica people. And we've just wrapped it up. Um, thank you, Brianna. That was a masterclass. And your voice does need to be heard globally and your voice will be heard globally because we recorded this session and we already know that people around the world were waiting for this session because they wanted to hear your voice. Um, also, vo uh, people in New Zealand wanted to hear. So I want to thank the participants who joined us tonight for some really great questions and some tough questions. I cannot believe how easily effortlessly and intelligently you answered them Brianna they were fantastic thank you so I, I thank you again for your your incredible courage your incredible ability to communicate complex issues simply and from the heart and uh, I look forward to supporting uh, your voice and amplifying it in the future um, and for all of those who have been on this call, my colleague David has been sending uh, links to where you can find information on our Freedom Challenge, our climate justice action taking um, campaign. Um, but again, uh, I have been humbled and by your great conversation, Brianna, thank you for saying yes to Amnesty. Thank you. Thank you very much for everyone, to everyone who joined us and thank you to Amnesty for holding space. Right, and you'll see that there's lots of thanks coming to you across the, the Zoom chat. Okay, people go out there and get some kai and enjoy the rest of the evening, actually. Thank you for giving us your time. Thank you.